Well, good morning to you. Uh, a couple of things that I would like to address before I get into the message. Uh, first of all, uh, this is concerning our potluck and trivia night that we had last Sunday. We had a very busy week last week, and uh, I think it kicked off with that. I uh, had a, just a wonderful time, and I want to publicly say thank you uh, to Rick and Donna Ballard. Rick and Donna, uh, they were the ones that... Uh, they're the ones that cooked the barbecue for us. And those of you that we agree with me, it was delicious, right? And so I want to say thank you to them. Uh, then on Tuesday, we had our trunk or treat. Uh, I think it was probably the biggest trunk or treat we've ever had. Uh, we actually ran out of candy. If that's, a, that's a crisis on, on Halloween night. And, uh, uh, just, but we still had just a great time. It was just a lot of fun. And, and I want to say thank you to those of you that participated in that. Uh, how many of you, um, when it comes to seasonal decorating, you go straight from Halloween to Christmas? How many, there are some of you that actually do that, okay? November doesn't even matter. Uh, that's kind of the way it is at our house. We've already begun uh, Christmas decorating it at our house. And uh, it is for that reason that I, I just want to bring up that this is the time of the year as we look forward to the holidays, that we also take the time to bless our pastoral staff. Now, I've touched on this uh, last Sunday. I want to do it again today. Uh, we are entering the time of the year where uh, through a financial gift, uh, this is something I'm putting in your court. Uh, please talk to the Lord. Uh, decide what you can do. That's what the scripture says. And we just want to uh, just want to take the time to bless our pastoral staff at Christmas time to let them know how much we appreciate all that they do for us throughout the year. So I just wanted to put that reminder out there for you uh, as we get into the scripture. Okay, so with that said, let's get into the Word. Uh, we are continuing in our series entitled Jesus the Messiah. It is through this series that we are studying the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, today we're going to be continuing in Matthew chapter 18. Specifically, we're going to be looking at verses 15 through 20. And so if you've brought your Bibles and you would like to turn there, feel free to do so. Uh, let's start with a little bit of a review. Matthew 18 opens with the disciples' preoccupation with visions of greatness. They are imagining the office that they will hold, the power that they will wield, the money that they will make once Christ's kingdom is established upon the earth and it would seem that they are so preoccupied with this kind of stuff that the gospel tells us that they even at times would argue with one another over it. Now Jesus, he sees this and so uh, to combat this behavior, the Lord uh, we see in Matthew 18, he dedicates some time to the characteristics of a disciple. In other words, he shifts his focus from what a disciple should do to who a disciple should be. So what have we learned so far as to who a disciple should be? Well, the primary thing I would say that we've learned is that being a disciple requires that we humble ourselves in trusting and cooperating with God's process. We must cooperate with God's process, God's way of doing things over our own way of doing things, even when we don't like God's way of doing things, even when God's way of doing things doesn't fall in line with our own timeline, even uh, when God's ways don't make sense. I, I thought it was interesting that during the worship, uh, we sang a song and one of the phrases that we sang was, Jesus, you change everything. Well, can we just be honest for just a moment? We don't always want Jesus to change everything. We just want him to change some things. Nevertheless, being a disciple of Christ. Now, listen to me here, folks. I'm talking to you. Being a disciple of Christ requires your willingness, if necessary, for Christ to change everything. And you've got to come on board with that. So that's the first thing that we learned here in Matthew 18. Now, the second thing that we learned is that trusting and cooperating with God's process 
begins in his own house with his own people. I, I think you saw it uh, today. Uh, none of us is a finished project. We are all a work in progress. Do I hear an amen for that? We all share a common proclivity towards sin. Therefore, no place is this idea of trusting and cooperating with God's process more applicable than when it comes to ourselves and it comes to our communal Christian relationships. We all share in this communal obligation to combat sin by loving God and loving one another. John 13, 35 says this, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And look at this next part, if you love one another. And so loving one another is paramount to our identity and our characteristic as disciples of Christ. Now today, we're going to learn that, that our communal Christian obligation not only includes loving one another, but it also extends to holding one another accountable. And so this morning, we're going to talk about something that nobody really likes to talk about, and that is confrontation. And I, I couldn't help but think of how the Holy Spirit orchestrates things ahead of us. Uh, case in point, we've all had an extra hour of sleep. And so having had an extra hour of sleep, hopefully you're in a much better frame of mind. Um, if you had been sleep deprived, your attitude might not have been very good and therefore you wouldn't have been very receptive to this message. Uh, but seeing that we've all uh, had an extra hour of sleep, I can tell you're all in a good mood. Uh, we're going to talk about a tough subject this morning. And so it's, it's, it's I think, paramount that we look at this subject uh, as objectively and as with as good an attitude as possible. So with that said, let's get into the scripture. Matthew 18, verse 15. Let's read this together. Jesus is speaking here to his disciples. That is, he's speaking to us. And he says this, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. Okay, so let's, let's stop right there. Um, I think to begin this teaching and to understand this teaching, you've got to start with that word sin. Uh, in this context, the word sin means to miss the mark, to err, or to be mistaken. And so in a manner of speaking, what Christ is talking about here, he's talking about what I define as everyday sin. He's, in other words, not talking about some blatant, malicious, premeditated, unspeakable evil. He's talking about the stuff that we're all susceptible of doing on a regular basis. He, he's talking about maybe caving into a temptation or a knee-jerk reaction gone wrong or maybe having a bad attitude. Maybe you're at a place where your faith has gone a little stale. Maybe you're finding that you're submitting to your emotions or your circumstances a little more than you should. There's not a person in this room who's never done these kinds of things. Moreover, there's not a person in this room who is immune to these kinds of things. And so what Christ is saying is that we share this mutual responsibility to safeguard one another. We share a mutual responsibility to safeguard one another against sin and against, against this kind of behavior. Hebrews 10.25 says it like this. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And so while I would say that today's message is about confrontation, 
it's not so much about confrontation as it is about reconciliation. We're not getting in one another's business just for the sake of doing it. We're getting in one another's business for the sake of us reconciling ourselves to Christ and repenting of our sin, which I think is a good thing. How about you? All right. So let's get back to Matthew 18, 15. In Matthew 18, 15, the Lord gives this scenario of a brother or a sister who has sinned. And at this point, I should probably share with you that, that some Bible translations say uh, your brother or your sister has sinned against you. Against you. Now, the NIV Bible does not say that, but other translations do. And so... Uh, those other translations make the sin a little bit more personal. So there's two ways that you can look at this. Uh, you can look at this as a brother or sister literally sinning or wronging you personally. Or you can look at it through the lens that you witness a brother or a sister. You're aware of a brother or sister's sin. Maybe it's not against you personally, but maybe it's against someone else. In either way, in either scenario, your response is the same. Jesus says that your response is to address it personally and to address it privately. You don't bring other people into it. You don't gossip about it. And you don't put it on the prayer chain. Now, there's a reason for this. The reason for this, and you've already heard me say this over the course of the past couple of weeks, that to a certain extent, now to a certain extent, the communal Christian existence requires, it requires that we stick our noses in one another's business. Uh, James 5 says that we have an obligation to confess our sins to one another and to pray for one another. That's all he's talking about. He's talking about this responsibility that we share in being accountable to each other as well as being held accountable. And we can't do that. You just can't do that if you don't know what's going on in your neighbor's life. And if they don't know what's going on in your life. It is impossible for us to fulfill the commandment of James 5 to confess our sins and to pray for one another if we don't know what's going on in one another's life. Ergo, isn't, you, isn't that a fancy word? Didn't you like that word, ergo? <laughs> ergo, we have to stick our noses in one another's business. Now, I want to tell you, if you're going to be a part of the Christian community, if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, you're going to have to get used to that. You're going to have to get comfortable with letting your guard down. You're going to have to get comfortable with having people see you for who you really are. Now, I'm not saying that you have to hang out all your dirty laundry. But I am saying that we all have to get comfortable with loving one another enough that when we see somebody going in the wrong direction, that you've got the courage and you've got the concern enough to speak up and say something. So we're talking about accountability. And Jesus says that the first rule of accountability is that you gently and you respectfully and you privately, you confront that person with your concerns. And then, he doesn't say this, but it's certainly implied, you take the time to give them a response, for them to respond to you, to hear them out. And this is because your objective is not to win an argument. Your objective is not to force them to comply with your demands. Let's make sure that we all understand the objective here, the motivation. Your motivation is to get them back to Christ by extending to them an invitation 
to repent, which by the way is something that we all need from time to time. So I'm not talking this morning about something that is exclusive only to a certain quality or a certain grade of people. We're talking about everything uh, from, the, from the pastor all the way down. From time to time, we all need to be put on the straight and narrow. Pastor David, I'm so appreciative of him. He is trying to wean me off Diet Coke. <laughs> he is not doing a very good job, but he's hopeful. And I'm listening to him and I'm thinking about it. I'll get there. We're holding each other accountable. I haven't found a flaw in him yet to hold him accountable to yet. But I'm working on that as well. You can be sure. So that's the first rule of accountability. We've got to be willing to speak up. But we do it privately. We do it respectfully. And we take the time to hear them out. Now the second rule of accountability is you got to talk to them face to face. Which, let's, let's just admit, that can be hard. That can be very, very hard. And, and it, can, it can go either way. And so, because it can be hard, and especially in today's society, uh, we like doing things the easy way. And so, it's much easier to send a text message or an email. Right? Now, I'm not saying that a text message or an email is completely unacceptable, but there are problems with those forms of communication. For example, uh, a text or an email can imply that your point of view is more important than their point of view. It can imply that you just want to put your important, you want to just impose your point of view and not listen to what they have to say. Uh, Another problem with a text or an email is uh, unless it is worded and phrased, I mean perfectly, perfectly, it, it can be misunderstood and it can be misconstrued and it can come across as being offensive or condescending. You got to be careful with that kind of stuff. Another problem with the text or an email is it can imply that a face-to-face conversation is just not worth your time. And so there are problems with a text or an email. Neither, but on the other side of the coin, uh, with a face-to-face, you stand a better chance of communicating your sincerity. With a face-to-face conversation, you reduce the chances of being misunderstood. And, And you're saying to that person that his or her point of view matters to you. You know, it could be that after you take the time to hear somebody else out, you, you may discover that some of the initial information that you th- had or that you thought you had, uh, you, you might find out that it was inaccurate. And, and, and you may find out that your concerns were unfounded. But on the other hand, if your concerns are correct, then what you do is you extend an invitation to them. An invitation for them to repent. And Christ says that when they accept or respond to that invitation, you have won them over. Now that doesn't mean that you've got them over onto your side of the line or you've got them over into thinking along your lines. What it means, that won over, it means to spare. You spared them by extending to them an invitation to repent and to be reconciled to the body, you have spared them the heartache that their sin was going to impose upon them. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to spare one another the heartache of where somebody's sin has taken them. Now, let me get off task here for just a minute. I know, I know how the heart works. We are notorious, are we not, for thinking, well, that may have been the way that it ended up for so-and-so, but that's not the way it's going to end up for me. You want that? That is Jeremiah 17, 9. That is the deceitfulness of your own heart. For you to think that you can dabble in sin and have a different result from other people, that is foolishness. That is deception. And what we're talking about this morning is loving one another enough 
that if you will, we're slapping somebody across the face and saying, snap out of it. Your sin is not going to get you to that desired destination of life and life more abundantly. There is only one place that sin gets you and that is to death and destruction every single time. But our hearts are so deceitful that there are times that even the saints of God can be deceived into thinking that they can dabble in sin and it's not going to end up in that destination. No siree. Hear me this morning. We're talking about something uncomfortable to do, but it's paramount that we do it. Otherwise, the results could be disastrous. We just dedicated a little baby. Sweet little innocent baby. But you know what we often forget with our kids? If they are born with the same propensity for sin that we're born with. And they will not naturally on their own go toward righteousness. They have got to be guided. And so do you. And so do I. We have to be guided toward righteousness. And we've got, as a communal Christian organization, as as communal brothers and sisters in Christ, we've got to be willing to stand up to the plate. And when we see a brother or sister in Christ going in the wrong direction, we've got to be brave enough and concerned enough and loving enough and wise enough to point it out. That's what Christ is talking about. He's talking about confrontation. Now, best case scenario is that person will hear what you had to say and they will repent and they will be restored to God and they'll be restored to the community. And I think the best thing about it is all of that has taken place without any kind of hoopla or drama being drawn to the church family. It's all been done privately. It's all been done uh, in such a way that it hasn't drawn attention to that person. And I think that that's the goal. We don't want to embarrass anybody or shame anybody. That's, That's not the purpose of Christianity. The purpose of Christianity is reconciliation. Reconciliation to God through repentance. Okay, so best case scenario... We've, we've uh, won them over. Uh, we've uh, gotten them uh, back into the fold. End of story. But that's not always the outcome, is it? So if that's not the outcome, then what will we do? Well, let's continue reading Matthew eighteen sixteen. He says, but if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay, so, so let's say that after addressing your neighbor, they don't immediately respond. Now, that could be the case. Maybe they need some time. As I said, Pastor David is working on me to get rid of Diet Coke. I'm thinking about it. All right, I need some time to think about it. Sometimes we need some time to think about things. Okay, well, if that's the case, then the best thing that you can do is, is just leave them alone. Give them some space. Pastor David, give me my space. And just let them consider what you've said. In other words, let the Holy Spirit do his job. Let's let's just let the Holy Spirit do his job. Okay, but then Christ is saying here that um, after, say, in a reasonably extended period of time, and I can't say what that time is, but after a reasonably extended period of time, you see that they still have not changed. And there is... There is no change in their attitude. There is no change in their direction. Then he says that you go to them again. And this time you bring along additional witnesses. Now, notice that the motivation is not to cajole. It is not to force anybody. That doesn't do anybody any good to try to change somebody against their will. The motivation, the objective is still the same. In this instance, the Lord says is to establish the matter. To establish the matter. And and what that fundamentally means is to confirm the truth. 
to confirm the truth. Let me, let me explain it like this. Uh, Christ quotes Deuteronomy 19.15. Uh, 19, Deuteronomy 19.15 says, One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense they may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. All right, so I think this should be self-explanatory. It's quite easy for a solitary person to make an accusation. And therefore, it is quite common for a single solitary person to make a false accusation. However, when you have two or three witnesses who are all cooperating the same story, then it greatly reduces the chance of a falsehood and gets you closer to the truth. And that's the objective here. The objective here is to get to the truth. When one person confronts you over something you need to change, you can easily dismiss it as bias, as just one person's opinion. But when you have two or three people confronting you and they're on a unified front, then it looks less and less like bias and it looks more and more like truth. And when you refuse to listen to the truth of one person, well, that's called denial. But when you refuse to listen to the truth of a group of people, that's called defiance. And Hewitt Community Church family, I'm obligated to tell you that defiance has no place within the body of Christ. Okay? So how do you deal with defiance? Well, let's continue reading Matthew 18, 17. He says, if they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Okay, so here's where it gets a little more serious. But I think the first thing to keep in mind is that this step is applicable only after only after you've attempted at least two private confrontations. Now, the objective behind the two private confrontations was exactly the same. It was to bring that brother or sister to repentance while simultaneously protecting their honor. Believe it or not, even with this step, that objective remains unchanged. You might say that this third step is a way of advocating peer pressure. Maybe some kind of a peer pressure to lovingly bring a person to repentance and therefore reconciliation to God and back to the church body. Uh, that being said, there are some people who are so determined to stay in their sin, they'll cut off their noses to spite their face. Even to the point of accepting the loss of fellowship within the body. And Christ says that if that's the case, then you cut them off from fellowship and you have nothing to do with them. Now, let me make myself clear here. We're talking about an absolute last resort to a worst case scenario. Are you all hearing me this morning? We're talking about the absolute last resort to a worst case scenario. So we're talking about something that should never ever be taken lightly. And because of the seriousness of the situation, and this is, I'm gonna give you as my opinion. This, this, is not, this has not come from the scripture, but I do believe it's my opinion. It is my opinion that if we ever get to this place as a church body, where we have to confront someone publicly with their sin, and a decision is made, to cut off fellowship with them, then in my opinion, I want you to hear me out on this, it's got to be a unanimous decision. It must be a unanimous decision on the part of the body. And let me explain why. Because the objective is still repentance and reconciliation. And let me tell you something. If you've got half of the body and they're cutting off this person from fellowship, and the other half of the body is engaging in fellowship, I can't see repentance and reconciliation happening. 
You know what I see happening? I see the church being split down the middle. And I don't see anywhere in the scripture where Christ is pleased when his people are split down the middle on anything. And so especially with this area of sin and confronting sin, God's people have got to be on the same page. I need you to hear me this morning. We've got to be on the same page. Now, how are we on the same page? Well, let, let's continue reading. Matthew 18, 18. Look at what the Lord says here. He says, truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, if you think that this is familiar, if this sounds familiar to you, that's because that Christ has already said this once before. Almost verbatim. He said it back in Matthew 16. And we evangelicals, we get kind of weird sometimes about binding and loosing. We think binding and loosing is you go around binding and loosing stuff. Can I just tell you, that's not what he's talking about. Let me tell you what he's talking about. He's talking about boundaries. He's talking about the standards by which the body of Christ lives. When you become a Christian... You are welcomed into the body of Christ just as you are. But you are not welcome to stay as you are. If you're going to be a part of the body of Christ, you're going to have to do some changing. Not some changing from some kind of external pressure from us. No, you're going to have to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to do what this word tells you to do. And I'm just going to tell you from, from personal experience that the word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is going to talk to you about losing some of your old habits while picking up some new ones. The word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is going to talk to you about walking away from some things while you're walking toward other things. I'm going to tell you that the Holy Spirit and the word of the Lord is going to challenge you and it's going to correct you and it's going to stretch you and it's going to use you. And sometimes he's going to perform all of that with interaction within the family and the body of Christ. And so he's talking about everybody being on the same page in terms of the standards of Christian living. The church has got to adopt the biblical standards of God's word and how it lives. No exceptions. No modifications. You know what makes this teaching so difficult? Is uh, back in the first century, if a Christian was put out of a fellowship for sin, he didn't have any, else, any place else to go. Usually, there was only one church in town. Well, today... We have churches on every street corner. And so if a believer leaves a fellowship over sin, well, all he has to do is go across the street. And if that doesn't work, then he just goes. And I think that explains why you don't see this kind of teaching demonstrated in our churches these days. But it doesn't alter the fact That we as a church body, we've, we've got to agree on the biblical standards of God's word. And we've got to agree to enforce those boundaries. Now, we've got to enforce them the right way. And we need to enforce them for the right reason. 
And Christ is saying that when we enforce the biblical boundaries of God's word the right way and for the right reason, then he will bless it and he will honor it even when man doesn't. And I think that's paramount for us as a church today because we're being bombarded with criticism and accusations. Sometimes they're from outside the church body and sometimes they're from inside the church body about modifying and changing the biblical standards of God's word. And when it happens, we've got to be unanimously willing to stand up and say no. Now, we don't, want, we don't do it with a bad attitude. We don't do it through violence. We don't do it through a hateful spirit. There's a right way to do it, and, and we do it lovingly. But you, you, we got to do it. You, you got to do it. I can tell this is going over really, really well. Maybe you should have had two extra hours of sleep last night. We're not looking for man's approval here. We're looking for God's approval in how we operate as a communal Christian body. Let me, let me start bringing this to a close. Matthew 18, uh, now verse 19 and 20. Christ is still speaking here and he says, Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything. See, there's that idea of agreement. If two of you agree on earth about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Now, I think it's important that we understand that Christ is still talking here about this subject of confrontation and, and holding one another accountable. That's, that's what he's still talking about here. And, and here's what he's saying. Um, you remember a few weeks back we talked about uh, in Matthew 18, Christ shared the parable of, of the shepherd and he would leave the 99 to go after the one. You remember we talked about that? We read about that? One of the things we talked about is, and one of the things that that parable illustrates is just how one erring sheep, just one, can negatively impact the entire body. Just, just one erring sheep can disrupt the entire herd. Nevertheless, an effort is made to retrieve that erring sheep, bring it back into the fold, and when it's brought back into the fold, the shepherding community, they celebrate. And that's the way it should be for us. When we confront uh, someone in a sin and they repent, then sure, we should bring it back in, celebrate it, and move on. But what Christ is saying here in Matthew 18, 19, and 20 is while there is a time to go after the erring sheep, there is also a time when you finally let that sheep go. Because you cannot afford to have that erring sheep continuously disrupt the community. In essence, what Christ is saying here is that unity within the body is so paramount to its survival and its usefulness within the kingdom of heaven that if someone within the church is constantly challenging, challenging or violating biblical standards of the church and that church is putting up with it, then that church is not going to go anywhere. And it's not going to accomplish anything. And so when the conflicts arise, they need to be addressed and they need to be talked out with repentance and reconciliation. The goal, sometimes that will be achieved and sometimes it won't. 
But because in today's culture, a, a sinner that is confronted, a believer that's confronted over sin, you know, they can get mad and they can just leave and go across the street and simultaneously we're immersed in an American church culture that is preoccupied with numbers. We look at the numbers and we don't want the numbers to go down. We don't want anybody leaving because we've offended them because we've held to some kind of Christian principle because that's going to affect the numbers. And so for the sake of the numbers, some of our churches are willing to modify the truth. Well, Christ, he foresaw this. And he's saying, look, don't be so preoccupied with the numbers. He says, yeah, it could be. It very well could be that when you confront a brother or sister about a sin that they are committing, it very well could be that they could leave your body. They, they could leave your church fellowship and go someplace else. And, and maybe, maybe they might take some of their friends or some of their family members with them. Maybe, just maybe, they'll take their, their financial contributions with them and their family members their friends they'll take their financial support and maybe just maybe maybe they're one of the top 10 contributors in your church oh where are you going to be then you know what the lord says he says even then even if it dwindles down to where they're just two or three i'm in the midst of you i'm in the midst of you and, and that term in the midst it means the evidence will be there. He says, listen, when you hold to the standards of my word, and I cannot overemphasize this enough. I know we're running out of time. But he's saying, if you hold to the standards of my word, and you do it unanimously as a church body, and the bigger we get, the harder that's going to be. But he said, if you'll do it, if you'll all be on the same page, I will bless you. I will bless you no matter what men say. And I will bless you even if it comes down to a place where you have to confront somebody about it. I am so glad this message is now over. <laughs> this has been some hard stuff. But I've told you before, I'm obligated to preach the hard stuff right along with the easy stuff. Now, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to consider what has been preached from this pulpit this morning. And I'm asking you to take it personally in two respects. Number one, I want you to ask yourself, or maybe allow the Lord to examine your heart. Where do I stand on the standards of God's word? Where, where do I stand? Where do we as a church stand in some of these critical areas? Areas concerning the gospel. Areas concerning how it is that a believer is to live in a sinful world. And then ask yourself, am I living according to those standards? And then finally... I would ask you to examine yourself and say, am I willing to love my brother or my sister enough that if I see them erring, that if I see them going in the wrong direction, am I willing to speak up and say something about it? Father, today we, we come to you in Jesus' name. I thank you that you've been among us today. I, I have sensed your unmistakable presence to the very best of my ability. I have tried to communicate your word. This is not one of these fun messages that pastors like to preach, but it is absolutely necessary for the body of Christ to mature. 
There are probably other pastors that could have preached this much better than me, that could have communicated it better than me, but oh well. Now it's been said. And so it's no longer a matter of hearing it or understanding. It's, it's now a matter of what we're going to do with it. And so I, I pray over this congregation this morning. I, I may have said some things that have made some people mad and they may never come back to this church again. And if that's the case, then I rely upon your Holy Spirit to intervene in that situation. But I think, I think that you are creating in your people an urgency. For lack of a better way to say it, a knowing that you are returning soon and that you are returning for a church that is fully committed to you. Fully committed. Because that's the only kind of church you're looking for. And I would pray that Hewitt Community Church, we would be among those that you're coming back for. So help us, Lord, with what we have learned today. Help us to apply it to ourselves and to our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm almost hesitant to ask if you've been blessed from having been in God's house today. <laughs> I hope that you have, but I tell you, you know, even when it's hard, God is good, right? And he's got good things to say and he's got good things in store for his people. And you've been blessed. You're a blessed people. And so I would challenge you as you leave here today, uh, leave here today committed to being a blessing to others, would you? Uh, we'll see you Wednesday night. If we don't see you Wednesday night. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless you.